At Pleasant View by mid-1901, the Woodbury attack against their leader had been defeated. But with the challenges ahead, reinforcements were all the more needed. Meanwhile, the place where these challenges were felt the most had been changing. Mrs. Eddy had continued to refurbish her home. It was now painted a lighter color. At the front door, a carriage port had been added. Above it, there was now a sunroom where she liked to spend her evenings. The grounds were landscaped with flower beds, garden paths, and gazebos. There was a man-made pond in the back pasture and a fountain on the front lawn, gifts from grateful students. One worker said his time in the household was the happiest year of his life. Pleasant View was pleasant for all the rigors of the daily regimen within. I want quiet and a Christian life alone with God, Mrs. Eddy wrote. From dawn to dusk, a typical day at Pleasant View was planned with that thought in mind. She arranged her every moment to set aside specific times for prayer. Mrs. Eddy said to me, The first thing I do in the morning when I awake is to declare I shall have no other mind before divine mind, and become fully conscious of this, and adhere to it throughout the entire day. Calvin C. Hill. Our leader on awakening at six invariably rang for her maid. This ring was at the same time a signal to the kitchen that Mrs. Eddy would soon be ready for her breakfast. George Kinter. While she ate, her maid laid out her clothes at her instructions. Dressed for the day, she passed from her chamber to the adjoining room with the tower view. What shall I call that wonderful room in which it might almost be said she lived? And yet living room does not by any means define it. Mother's sitting room, Mr. Fry generally called it. Her study, another familiar name for the room of so many titles, but in reality it was her workroom. George Kinter. Her workday invariably began with her lifelong practice of opening the Bible at random to see what message it had for her. Adelaide still recalls that Mrs. Eddy would let the pages of her Bible fall open and read whatever verse her eyes rested on, often doing the same with her science and health. Usually, she would read them aloud to anyone in the room with her. Many days, she would call the mental workers and give them a lesson from these passages. Then she would sit by herself, thinking and praying. Her day was ordered like clockwork. If anyone had an appointment with her, he must be ready to see her on the dot. John Selko. Around 9 o'clock, she liked to take a quick tour of the first floor parlors, dining room, library, noting with pleasure how nicely her home was being cared for, sometimes coming to the kitchen to discuss menus or recipes. Back in her study, she would turn to her mail and other work for the morning, writing as she had for years on a tablet on her lap. Mrs. Eddy abandoned the use of steel pens once and forever when the fountain pen made its appearance. It worked quicker and with all its shortcomings was cleaner. She made much use, too, of the lead pencil, a supply of which Mr. Fry always had on hand for her, standing point up in a small vase, and each morning they were freshly sharpened. George Kinter. Her tower room was indeed her workroom, as she wrote, corrected proof sheets, or dictated messages and instructions. At 11, most days, all that came to a halt. She told artist James Gilman, When you want me, come to my door and knock until 11 o'clock. She added after a little pause, laughingly, I will not be knocked at by anybody after that until lunchtime. I judge this to be to her a sacred hour. James Gilman. No matter what the weather, Mrs. Eddy came out on the rear veranda each day and sat in her swing to talk to God, as she expressed it. Minnie Wygant. At noon, dinner was put on the table. Minnie and her sister Mary bringing serving dishes through the pantry. Those of us who helped in the kitchen could see Mrs. Eddy through this serving door as she sat at the head of the table. It was a favorite trick of hers to lean over and peer at this door, blowing a kiss to Mary or me. Minnie Wygant. As she ate, 
her maid got her out-of-door clothes ready for her daily carriage drive. John Salkow recalled Mrs. Eddy asking to have peanuts and candies put up in little bags to take with her to give to children she passed on her drive. At one, regular as clockwork, Salkow would be at the carriage port to hold the horses as she stepped into her carriage. Sometimes she would first come around to pat the horses' heads and talk to them. One day on the road, the horses had bolted and galloped off, with Mrs. Eddy leaning out of the window, calling to the horses to quiet them. A year later, the carriage was being driven by a new coachman, Joseph Mann's brother, August, accompanied almost always by Calvin Fry. Prior to the runaway, Mr. Fry had not accompanied Mrs. Eddy on her daily drive, but after that happened, he never let her go out alone again, Minnie Wygant. The daily drives gave her a respite and time for reflection. She told one of her workers, I have uttered some of my best prayers in a carriage. After her drive, Calvin Fry would sort the afternoon mail. He or one of the secretaries would bring the mail to her desk unless she had appointments with church officers, advisors, journalists, or others. In this well-ordered day of work and prayer, there was time for pleasantries and laughter, and visits with students and old friends. Mrs. Eddy did enjoy hearing a good story or repeating one to others. Minnie Wygant. She loved to joke a little at times, and occasionally, when asked a question which she did not wish to answer, she would say something humorous. Adelaide Still. Her laugh was so good to hear. It is true that she didn't laugh aloud very often, but when she did, it was worth waiting for. One day, Mrs. Eddy discovered a little spider. I think it was on her dress. She called to her maid to take it off at once. After her momentary agitation had disappeared, she smiled and said of herself, That was not the founder of Christian science. That was Mary, John Selko. On one occasion, it had been raining for days on end. Adelaide still recalled Mrs. Eddy, in a facetious mood, burst into a little poem. It's rain and yet, it's rain and yet, the blue skies are forgotten. The earth's a desolated spot, and vegetation's rotten. I hate to see the darkest side, I hate to be complainin', but hang me if my temper stands this rainin', rainin', rainin'. Then Mrs. Eddy told her, I wrote that when I was 16. As the day's work went on, the household was busy, but there were moments for pleasures and personal pursuits. Calvin Fry, John Salkow, and Minnie Wygant took up photography, with Minnie often hanging her wet negatives in the kitchen to dry. At five, Mrs. Eddy had a light supper, increasingly as time went on, served in her study. She ate simple food, never seeming to tire of homemade ice cream and custard pudding which were served twice a day. Also, she had a cup of soup both for dinner and supper, sometimes a little meat for dinner such as liver or squab, for supper, fish hash, cream toast, or cereal. Adelaide Still. After supper, there was time for the household, including Mrs. Eddy, to read the newspapers, time to chat or read, and time for music. Sometimes they all joined in an old songs and hymns Mrs. Eddy loved. Most days, no matter how busy, were pleasant and ended peacefully. Most evenings she spent the hours from seven to nine in the swing in the little room over the carriage port, savoring the peace and quiet of her own thoughts or enjoying a little company. One evening she was in her swing and rang my bell. I went to her. She was so lovely and said, I am so happy. Everything has been so harmonious. God is so near me. I feel stronger and can do my work. Mary Armstrong. Even enjoying the twilight, she counted the minutes. A little clock sat beside her, the face lit by a small battery-powered lamp so she could watch the time. The bare bulb shined in her eyes, so Calvin, the former machinist, made her a small metal shade using a key ring as a base. When I returned from supper, I often found Mr. Fry chatting with her about events or news of the day. She was usually in bed by 
Always, her science and health and a pad and pencil were placed on the small table at the head of her bed. And occasionally, she would call us all in after she had retired and give instruction for handling certain phases of error or some special problem which needed solving. Adelaide still. The problems calling for Mrs. Eddy's attention did not stop at bedtime. Clara Shannon recalled a night, well after 9.30, when a packet came to the door. It contained letters from the directors of the Mother Church asking for their leader's guidance. Mrs. Eddy was asleep in bed. Calvin and Clara decided not to disturb her rest. The packet could wait until morning. But in a short time, Mrs. Eddy awoke and rang and asked if something had come from the directors. When she read the letters, she told Clara they raised an issue that called for great wisdom but she wasn't sure what direction to take. She said, I don't know what is best to do, but love will show me the way. She told me to get her block of paper and a pencil and to write. I sat on the carpet beside the hot air register and wrote at her dictation. She said, God bids me do so and so, but I don't see the reason why. The dictation, typing, rewriting, and pondering went on for hours. As Mrs. Eddy edited each page, Clara brought it down the hall to Calvin. He typed another draft, and it was brought back to Mrs. Eddy's room. Several times she corrected that manuscript, saying, That does not make the meaning clear enough. I must put better words to express what God meant. At about 2 or 2.30 a.m., I said to her, Mother, why don't you wait to write this till tomorrow? She said, And what will become of our cause if I waited? This will be on its way to Boston at half past five ready for the director's meeting at eight o'clock. Then I replied that we read in the Bible that the darkness and the light are both alike to thee, and there shall be no night there. And we both laughed heartily. In the morning, Mrs. Eddy's message of guidance was on the 5.30 train to Boston. Later, after she had been for her walk on the veranda, she said to us as she came into the room, Love has shown me the reason why and she explained to us the reason. Then she said, very seriously, I want you always to remember that Mother had to obey God before she knew the reason why. Clara Shannon. Such would have been a typical day in the household of Mary Baker Eddy. <laughs> 